me explain. What you see here tonight. If you're relatively new to our church or perhaps you're visiting with us tonight or perhaps you've been part of our church for a long time. We believe, you see, part of what I preached this Sunday morning, yesterday, was that we don't believe in a God who has any limitations. I said we don't believe in a God who has any limitations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God asked Abraham the question, and he asked Christians today. He asked churches today, pastors. He asked this question today. God asked the question to Abraham and said, Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? You see, we came in here tonight, and what you saw was, what you've seen over the last little while is like an intervention. If you've seen reality shows, you know exactly what that is. An intervention with the Holy Spirit and the power of Pentecost, the power of of the Holy Ghost intervenes in a service and begins to move it started in our worship did you get a sense of what was happening and it was like there was a, a waiting that was going on Cameron was led by the Spirit I knew he was being led by the Spirit and I wanted him to continue to do what he was doing And if he hadn't I would have jumped up here but he did good boy. following the leading of the Spirit of God you see, ultimately, at the end of the day, this is not about church. It's about God. It's about God. God wants you to believe Him for big things. You can be seated if you want to. He wants you to believe that He's big. He wants you to believe Him with faith to be able to move a mountain if necessary. The God of the Bible, not just the Old Testament, the New Testament, Jesus said, if you believe, you'll say to that mountain over there, remove to yonder place, go over there and get in the river. Jesus, all throughout the word, shares with us the importance of us having faith in a God who has no limitations. God wants the world, wants his people to believe him for big things. He wants us to believe him for little things. He wants us to just believe that he is God. That he can handle any situation that you and I don't have to figure it out. We don't have to work it through. We don't have to make the plan. We can trust him to see us all the way through. And God specializes in things that are absolutely impossible. That's what Luke said. He said, for nothing shall be impossible with God. But God asked the question to Abraham, and I feel like he's asking us all day today. Stratford Heights, Christian, you're worried, you're stressed out, you tried to plan it and figure it all out for yourself you you've tried to calculate it and you've tried to justify it and you've tried to make it all okay in your mind and yet you've done all of that in fear of what God would say so you hide from him man I feel the Lord here tonight God wants you you to trust that not only does he know what to do, but he has the very best plan for you. He has the very best plan for you. His way is the best way. Don't fear God's way. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. If God is a limitless God, if he has all power, if he has all knowledge, and if he is everywhere at all times, 
then what is the problem? Then what is the problem? We limit God. I said we limit God. What you've seen here tonight with some folks who dared to, to come in here and, and we dared to move away from our doxology. We dared to move away from our order of service because God showed up. And sometimes he just messes up our little playhouse. Sometimes he messes up, and not that we're playing house, he messes up our order of service. Just so we remember that it's all him and not us. And that it's not the choir or the praise team or the, the turner minister of music. It's not him. If God touches in the service, it's him and he gets the glory. He gets the credit. He gets the praise. When I pray for people, I've told people before, if I don't feel, Caleb, if I don't feel the power of God, if I don't feel the, the presence of the Lord, I'll be the first one to sit in the back. But when I feel Him, when I feel Him like strength in my back, when I feel Him empowering my legs, and I feel like He puts something in my eyes and I can see, who needs prayer or who needs a miracle who's desperate tonight for God when I can see that I know then I get bold as a lion I'll call you out and it won't worry you you don't have to worry I'll never call you out if you're scared and you don't want it and you're afraid I'm gonna call you out usually the folks that if I walk up the island like I did old Lester, uh, old Lester I can guarantee you Lester didn't have a problem with me calling his name out because he came in here tonight hungry for God and he wants to leave filled full of what God has for him. So the Bible's clear to point out, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. God will touch the hungry. God will touch the thirsty. He'll touch those that are in need. He'll minister to you. Now, I don't necessarily feel like everybody got it tonight, but we're not done yet. But it's important tonight that we truly understand what he does. He intervenes. He breaks in where we are, and we're a church sensitive to that. We want to move in the presence of the Lord. And when I feel him, when I know he's doing something, uh, that's, to me, that's the greatest. I could preach. I could preach a seven-point outline. And I could have me an introduction and a conclusion that would knock your socks off. And the Holy Ghost can do in five minutes what I couldn't do in an hour. I already know that. And so when I feel him, when I feel a wave... Sandra, the power of God come through, I don't fight it. I get in there and ride it. I'll, I'll walk that thing out. I want, I want to see who he wants to touch. I want to see what miracle he wants to bring to pass in this house. And there have been many tonight. That's how you know that God is in the middle of it. And God's doing something amazing. So you've come by a church tonight that believes he's a limited limitless God that he has no end he's infinite in his power and he is absolutely able to do anything and nothing is too hard for him I read to you this morning scripture that answered the question that Abraham was asked by God Jeremiah 32 and 17 said, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. God asks you and I that very same question tonight. 
Do you need to figure it all out for yourself? Are you tired of that? Are you done with that? Because God wants you to answer the question, can he do it? You can't fix yourself. You can't fix the situation. You can't make it better. You can't, you can't get a hold of a preacher to make it better. Then a preacher in this house can make it better. Ain't nobody can fix it. Only him. Only him. But what a good job he can do. What a good job he can do. But we limit him. And in a few minutes that we have, the kids will be back around 8.30. They hit some snow in Kentucky. Rebuke that. Young people will be back, they said, around 8.30. So you might, depends on what we do around here, you might want to run, get you a burger, and come back. We'll leave the light on for you. But the Bible is clear to point out that we are the ones. And th I want to get this across. I've got to share this with you tonight. I knew when we were done with this part of the service a few minutes ago. I didn't quench nothing or stop it. I felt we were done for right now. But I want you, I want you to see a simple truth about what happens. You see, we believe God is omniscient, omnipotent. That he is omnipresent. That he's all powerful. That he has no limits. But know something that we see in the word of God. All throughout the word we do find that man through his own will. Which God said in the beginning. He said let us make man in our image. And he gave us the freedom the will to accept or reject man has the ability to limit God in Psalm 78 and 41 we see where the children of Israel God had set them free from bondage in Egypt God had led them out promised them a deliverer and wanted to take them to the land flowing with milk and honey and what would have been only 11 miles in their journey to get to the promised land ended up being 40 years and not a one of them entered the promised land. Why? God's will? No. God's work in their lives? No. God changed the plan? No. What you find with the children of Israel is that they rebelled against God. They didn't want to believe God. They, if you remember, the 12 spies went over and spied the land and they freaked out and 10 of them came home and gave a negative report and two, Joshua and Caleb said, uh-uh, it's good, let's go over and, and possess the land. And the 10 said no and everybody bought into the testimony of the negative, the 10. And so because of their rebellion and because with God telling them they have it, the land is theirs, I'm leading you. I'm going to take you through. We've already done some miraculous things with the children of Israel down in history, but you aren't seeing that. You aren't, you aren't remembering the power of God. So because you don't remember who I am and you don't know what I can do for you now, you're slated to wander this wilderness for 40 years and you'll die in the wilderness and you'll never go to the promised land. God reached out his hand to them. He said, here it is. Reach out and take it. God says to us, here it is. I've got the keys to the kingdom. I've got the, the world in front of you. I will cause you to run through a troop and leap over a wall. I will cause you to be victorious. I will cause you to be a mountain climber. I will cause you to walk on the water if necessary. God says to us, there's nothing that I won't enable you and empower you to do. You'll not face anything. You'll not even drink something that'll hurt you. A snake won't hurt you. The poisons of the world won't hurt you. Worldly winds won't hurt you. Storms won't hurt you. You have God in your corner. And there, the prophet was clear to point out to the servant, there is more that be for us than who are against us. We know this is true. 
The Bible says in Psalm 78 and 41, listen to this terrible indictment against the children of Israel. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Psalm 78 and 41. Read it in every translation you can find. It all says the same thing. Man limited God. I don't want to limit him tonight. I don't want to limit him. I want him to have his holy, sacred, almighty way in my life. I want it to be that way in our church. I don't want to be led by committee. I appreciate those who serve on committees. I appreciate those who serve on teams. I appreciate those who serve on our pastoral staff. I appreciate the counsel of the church, but I appreciate the church of God. I appreciate those things, and we work together on projects, and we believe God helps us to do that together in unity, and it's wonderful. But I don't want to be led by committee. I want to be led by the Spirit of the living God. I want to walk in the power of the Almighty. The idea is preposterous that they would limit God. Think about it. Limiting God. We wouldn't even want to say that out loud. Limiting God. Well, what are you doing in your life? What's your testimony? Well, I limited God. Really? Think about how he governs the laws of nature. He's not limited in nature. He's not limited in physics. He's not limited in knowledge. He's not limited in power. Yet, in the hearts and minds of man, he's limited at times. Very important tonight that we understand and we take a position, a solid position, that says, God, I won't limit you in my life. God spoke something to you tonight, Joran. Don't think I'd embarrass you by telling you God spoke a word of you that he was going to complete the work that he'd started in you. God don't do anything halfway. God finishes what he starts. God don't start a project and back off of it. Sometimes I'm guilty of that. God don't do that. God will perfect and follow through on every Every project he ever begins. And I'm thankful in 1981 at an altar at Hera Arena, he started a project on me. And he is not going to stop until I cross the finish line. He's not going to stop until I get to the place like Paul did where he said, I fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I've finished the race. He's going to do what he's promised in his word always. He's going to finish the work in you. God's not limited in any way. Yet we read in this scripture that they limited the Holy One of Israel. Man limited God. Imagine the clay telling the potter, you can only mold me and shape me up this much. Aren't we bold? Aren't we arrogant? Proud? God? Imagine Clay telling the potter, you can only go so far. You can only do so much, and that's it. Imagine the creature telling the creator, you can only go this far with me. You can only take me this far down the path, and no more. Imagine the sheep telling the shepherd, you can only lead me here, but not there. I'll go over here. Shepherd, but I won't go over here. Imagine the sheep telling the shepherd, I'll only let you take me this far. Imagine the rudder telling the ship, I'll only go east, but you'll never get me to go west. Yet this, as preposterous as that sounds, as unimaginable as that sounds, that's what you and I do when we draw a line in the sand and we are determined that God's going to do it our way. We set boundaries. We set perimeters. We decide how much of God, will, how much God will have of us. We make a decision on how far we will go in our relationship with the Lord. We make decisions on how far we'll go in our belief, in our doctrines, in our faith, and how far we'll believe in the Word of God. We make decisions all day long that do nothing more than limit God. I say We take the limits off. I say, we say to God, you got all of it. We sing it. We sing, I surrender all, but do we really? 
We make our own decisions, don't we? We make our own plans, don't we? We work out our own salvation, don't we? We make a decision on what we'll do. We make a decision on where where we'll be obedient. We make a decision on how much of us he'll use in ministry, how much of us will, will be available. We make decisions all the time to limit God. Our only answer, our only correct and right answer before the Lord is to lay down before him on this altar and say, I surrender all. I give everything to you. I lay it all out there. Lord, cut me open. Do surgery. Whatever you have to do to remove all of the negativity, all of the fleshly desire and will, move that out of my life because I want to walk in that beautiful, perfect will of God. God has a predetermined will. He has a a plan. He has a destiny. He has a path in front of you and I. It's laid out beautifully, and we fight him tooth and nail our entire lives. We set perimeters around us. We bind him. It's like putting God in a neat little box so that he won't interfere with certain areas of our life. We confine God by putting him in a straitjacket. He's not able to do the things to lead us and to dedicate to his own purpose in our lives. We draw that line in the sand that says, you can't go past this line, God. You can have this much of me. You can have this part of me, but you cannot have all of me. God, help us tonight, and God, stir within the hearts of men and women who've come by here tonight, not by accident, who've come by here tonight to hear a message that says he's an unlimited, infinite, holy, powerful God. And he wants you from head to foot. There's no other response that you can give him except have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. All of me. I surrender all to you, Lord. That's the only proper response. When we understand that and see that, we'll see it's the very best for us that there could possibly be. You will not go wrong. You will not be less happy. You will not be less fulfilled by doing it God's way, by doing it the right way, by staying true to the tenets of the faith and the doctrines of the word of God. You'll not go wrong when you trust in God with your whole life and your whole future. When you trust him for your destiny and you give him your life in every way, you will not end up miserable or unhappy or feeling like you've made a sacrifice. You will be fulfilled. You will be happy. I can tell you straight forward, I can tell you this. When I accepted the call of my life and I started following him, somebody looked at me not too long ago and they said, well, you know, you've just, you've never, I don't really talk about this very much because it's such a a boring subject, but somebody asked me one time, you know, why aren't you married? You know, I haven't really worried about that. I I haven't. I don't worry about, I don't know why. Every other young man, or I, I call myself young, but every other guy in the world would be worried about it. I mean, they they worry themselves sick over that. I don't worry about it. I don't know what it is with me. I don't know how it was. I don't know why it came down like it did. But I do know this. I know there's not been one unfulfilled, unsatisfying day, not in my life. I have lived for him, and I've honored him in my life, and I've made mistakes all along the way. But I can tell you tonight, I'm as happy as any other human being on the face of the earth because I feel the power of the Holy Ghost down inside me, churning like a fire shut up in my bones. That doesn't say that he can't change all that in a dime. I might be in the nursing home and find little... Frida over there, not, not, not Frida. <laughs> Don't worry, Vic, not that Frida. <laughs> Martha, toothless Martha, meeting me at the dinner table in the dining room, and I'm winking at her from my wheelchair. I, it, may be, it may happen. But I'm going to tell you the truth. You've met somebody who's not caring about it. You met somebody who if it happens, it happens. But in the meantime, I'm going to be satisfied on my journey walking this path. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'm filled with peace and love of God Almighty. And I'm doing all right. Don't you worry about me, Mama. Don't you worry. You know I'm anointed when I bring that subject up. (laughs) 
God wants to do so much in our lives. He wants to bless you, bless your family, bless your children. He wants to bless our church. He wants to bless your prayer life. He wants to remove all boundaries. He wants to remove all limitations. Wasn't it God, wasn't it Jesus who was on his way to be crucified when he stopped and he looked over the hill into Jerusalem and the Bible says he wept. He wept. Why did he weep? Because he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto you, how often I would have gathered thee together even as a hen gathers her chickens, but you would not. You willed not. You limited me. Can you imagine the Lord himself, Jesus, weeping over Stratford Heights Church? It'll never happen. Not as long as I'm pastor, I'll kill every demon in my path. I don't want him weeping over our city, weeping over our community, weeping over this church. I want to follow him, and if that means I, I don't, you don't agree with me, if that means that you get red in the face and want to walk out, then that's just the way it's going to be. I'm going to follow what I feel in my heart. I'm, I am, I'm called to do this right now, and this is where I'm at in my season of life, and there'll be another pastor down the road, and you can tell him what you think and what you feel. But I'm going to tell you, I, while I believe there's a multitude of peace and many counselors, I do believe that there is a leading and a guiding for a pastor who is a shepherd and an under-shepherd who is supposed to know exactly what to do from God Almighty. I don't need a committee. I need confirmation. Hallelujah. Understand, I'm not an arrogant, conceited idiot. I do believe in counsel. I do believe in having wise counselors around me. I do believe in there being unity in the body of Christ. But somebody's got to be the pastor. Somebody has to stand up and take the lead. Somebody's got to walk the walk that God has called them to walk. And that is, happens to be me right now. And so I get on my face and I'm like, Lord, if the, the businessmen disagree with me, if, if a few folks don't necessarily like the decision that I've made, I've got to be willing to stand up and follow what I feel in my heart, irregardless of what they think or what they feel. I've got to be willing to do that. And what I've found is that when I've made a decision and determination that I will follow the Lord, usually those that are spiritually minded come right alongside and they agree, and the confirmation is there. Amazing, though. All through the Word of God, whenever God spoke to anything, it was a bush, a sea, a fish, an axe head, the winds or the waves, they all obeyed him every time. But not nah, man. Not nah, man unwillingness limits God and so it's important for us tonight to say God no limits I repent of boundaries lines I repent Lord of places I've said you can't go with me places you can't take me Things I won't do for you. I repent. Have thine own way. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and shape me. Fill me. Till I am nothing in my own hands. But a vessel you have made to honor. Number two. Our spiritual lives sometimes can limit God. You remember the church of Laodicea? Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Jesus says to the church at Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. What was the sin of the church of Laodicea? Well, you remember it well. This is where we get... That scripture that talks about in Revelation chapter 3 as well. That they were neither hot nor cold. But they were lukewarm. 
And because they were lukewarm, God said, I will spew you out of my mouth. God says, I would rather you be cold because then you can be reached. Then you know your need. You know how cold you are. You know how indifferent you are. You know that you're in need. I would that you were cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, you make me sick. And yet the problem I see is a whole lot of unconcern in the hearts and lives of Christians. Lukewarmness. Room temperature. Now they don't, they're not excited about Jesus, but they're not madly in love with him either. They don't hate the enemy, but they don't stand for nothing neither. They aren't really sold out to anything. They're just kind of piecemealed out according to desire. They live in halfway, halfway in and halfway out, just in enough to not think they got a problem so they don't seek the face of God or seek any revival of their own life or heart. They just end good enough to stir up division and trouble and to make other people angry and mad and just there to cause dissension. Lukewarmness means you become available for whatever side you happen to be leaning towards that day. Oh, you might be all in on the revival one week, but the next week, you're not sure what you're standing for. Lukewarm. I would that you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Just sort of in the middle. Kind of reminds me of what I see in churches today, just a, a general unconcern. Unconcern. Well, we don't preach that at our church. Well, I had somebody who said this to me just the other day. Well, we are a Pentecostal church. Oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah, but you know, but we don't really, we're not like Stratford. I said, oh, you're not? I said, how is Stratford? And they said, well, I mean, you know, you guys like really like get into it. I said, we're Pentecostal. As a matter of fact, we're assemblies of God. But we don't practice that. And I just said, oh. And I didn't want to judge and condemn and come off like a snot. <laughs> so I just said, okay. And then the conversation went on and on. And, and I know that she wouldn't mind me, me telling this because here's how the conversation ended up. She said, by the time we got through it all and I was just being kind and and she was, yeah, we, just, we don't do that. I, as a matter of fact, I've been there for 12 years, and I've never heard anyone speak in tongues in my church. I was like, oh, we do. <laughs> she said, yeah, yeah we, we, don't, we don't really see a lot of that. And, and you know, pastor has a room, and, and if somebody wants special prayer or if they want to, you know, they, they go to that room after service. And. And people will meet him there, and they'll have private prayer. It's because it's private. I said, oh, okay. We just bring them up front. <laughs> <laughs> but in the conversation, it turned, and she said, you know, I kind of miss that. And I said, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's pretty cool when I started sharing about a couple things that had happened recently in our services and tears were in her eyes. And she said, I, I really do miss that. I, yeah. I've never, she said this, she, as God is my witness, she said, you know, I've never really felt the presence of God in my church like I felt when I went to Stratford years ago. Yeah. And I said, well, I said, it's not Stratford. I said, it's just the Holy Spirit. I said, you have him in your church too. He's just got to be free, free to move, unlimited. 
with tears in her eyes, she said, you know, I'm going I'm to visit. So when she comes, don't y'all say a word. <laughs> and just so you don't think I'm just talking gossip, it's my, one of my cousins, and she would be perfectly fine with me saying what I've said. But it was amazing to me how the conversation went from, yeah, we don't do that, to I sure do miss that. See, when you get away, it becomes easy and comfortable. And when you get out, it becomes comfortable and easy to just lay back and do less and less and less and less and less until that's okay. That's okay. The only problem with that is that that works. It works until you hit a crisis. Or you hit a need. Or you hit a tragedy. And you need somebody who can get a hold of God. I can't count the people that will call our church. Who don't attend our church. They attend elsewhere. But they'll call here when there's a crisis. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm not trying. I hope you understand my heart. I'm not trying to say we're all that. We got our faults. Some of you are, you follow right in line with the scripture when it says we're a peculiar people. Some of you are real peculiar. <laughs> Not me, of course, only you. But we're not perfect. We have our troubles. We got our times when we got to fall on the altar and repent. There are times we mess up and there are times we got a Christian, we got to get together and have a committee meeting because we've just done it wrong. We got to change something. We're just normal people. We're just humans. We limit God all the time, but we've got this desire inside of us and we've seen some things and we've been through some things. You know that old song, I've been through enough to know he'll be enough for me. I've come through too many times. There's no way. I've seen too much. I've been in too many situations. I've stood in the hospital at ICU one too many times and seen one miracle after another. I know what can happen with an unlimited God. I know what can take place when you don't put limits on him. I know what can happen when you want all that you can get from him. I know what it's like to be in an all-night prayer meeting at about 4 o'clock in the morning. The Holy Spirit show up and everybody goes absolutely just falling flat on their face. I know what it is to be in a place where the moving of the Holy Ghost is there in a fresh and beautiful wave of glory. I know what it is to see a, a young person laid out on the floor. One of the people that, that affected me the most in my life was my sister Angie who leads our praise and worship in our youth department. She was 11 years old laying in an altar and I knew Angie. I lived with Angie. She was my baby sister and I saw her laid out on the floor speaking in a, t in a tongue, in a language I'd never heard her speak before and I sat there as a young man watching her listening to her and I couldn't believe what I saw that affected me so greatly I knew the Holy Ghost was real because I knew Angie and I knew she didn't know how to do that she wouldn't know how to begin to do that but I saw that power working over her life and it wasn't too long until that very same power came roaring through my own heart and went down through my feet came back out my mouth and I began to speak with another tongue I already know too much I've seen too much and I I don't want to limit him tonight. I don't want to put the barriers on him. I want him to be free to move and to work in us and through us in this community. I want to be a lighthouse and I want people to see and know that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's the rescuer. He is the refuge. He is the rock of salvation and he can be found today. The blood has never lost its power. Oh, hallelujah. As we said this morning, it reaches to the highest mountain. It reaches down into the lowest valley. It's there for you and I. We can trust in him. We can lean on him. We can look to him when you don't know where to go. When you don't know what your next step is, you can look to God. Take the limits off. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. We please him with our faith. What is faith? Believe. Believe he is God and he's able to do anything. He can order the planets around. He can hang the stars at night. But he looks into the hearts of man and he can't even help them. 
because of their limitations. If he can order the stars tonight, if he can hang the planets anywhere he wants to, and yet some of us are so hardened in our hearts that he cannot penetrate. All because of love. And that's how I'll end tonight, Gary, if you'll help me. The Holy Spirit wants to use someone tonight. Let him use you. limitless God is able to move is able to use people he can raise up a mountain or he can drop it is anything too hard for the Lord I along with Jeremiah say no nothing is too hard for him Can you sing that song, Have Thine Own Way? Have thine own way, Lord. Would you stand with me tonight? Have, Have thine, thine own way. Thou art the Would you respond to him tonight, making an altar in there at your seat or at this altar for a few moments? This is an invitation to surrender to the unlimited power of God in your life. If you would respond to say, God, I will not limit you in my life. I will not put barriers and I'll not draw any more lines. I give you everything. I surrender all. Would you find a place? to make that consecration tonight right there at your seat or down here at the altar tonight
Thank you. I believe you're revealing to us. You're, you're touching us. You're challenging us as a church. Lord, I believe this is a group of people that love you with all their heart. I know we've seen marvelous and wonderful things in our midst, but God, to whom much is given, much is required. You're leading us into deeper places. You're challenging us to launch out into the deep to believe you for miraculous things and to see the hand of God move mightily without limitation in our hearts and in our lives, in our children, in our families, in our church. Touch us, oh Father God, to be at one together, unified in harmony with the work of your spirit in this church and in this community. Touch us together, Father, to, to enjoy the fellowship and to enjoy the unity that comes through spirits that are bonded together. I pray that you will minister your anointing over us as we move into this year. As we're challenged to reach out into our community and into the lives of those that you trust us with. Anoint us, Lord. Lead us. Guide us every step that we will, at the end of the day, pleasers of God use us mightily Lord we want to love this city we want to love our lost loved ones we want to see a great revival Lord in their hearts and lives and we know it begins with our faith with us seeing you for who you really are we give you the honor we give you the praise tonight for it all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and everybody said amen Amen. While these continue to pray, our ushers have reminded me that we have not given you the opportunity to worship the Lord with your gifts today. So as we are dismissed, why don't you stand with me all over the congregation? I'll do this very different than we normally would. And these that are in the altar can continue to pray. As the ushers go by your pew tonight then, then, and you've given what, what you've come prepared to give, then you're dismissed. But why don't we have prayer? And Brother Rick, why don't you pray over our, our worship and giving tonight? God bless you. Change.